This experiment focuses on one of the most basic concepts in all of chemistry, and that's the concept of the mole or, and molarity. You're looking at preparing solutions of different compounds. You've probably prepared a number of solutions already, either in chemistry or just in real life. If you ever made up salt water, you made up a solution. If you've ever made up sugar water, you've made up a solution. And by knowing the concentration of the solutions, you're knowing how much of the material is present in that solution or per unit volume of that solution. Chemistry itself is performed in the unit of moles. While you can measure things in a lab in grams, each of the molecules and each of the elements weighs a different amount. So to determine how many actual compounds or actual molecules or atoms you have, the concept of the mole is used. And since in chemistry you're using the mole to measure the amounts, the concept of molarity is how to determine the concentration of moles in a solution. And this is the concentration unit that would be focused on throughout chemistry. This experiment looks at the concept of the mole and molarity, which in chemistry is the unit at which concentration is measured. The experiment looks at preparing a number of different solutions and determining how many moles are in a particular volume of that solution. That uh, solution itself is at a molarity, which is another measurement of concentration. So the mole itself is just a number, and that number is a very large number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. That is one mole. Just like a dozen is 12, a baker's dozen is 13, one mole of something is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd of something. Um, and this is the unit that chemistry is based in. You're looking at, uh, if you look at a reaction and they say one mole of something reacts, that is an indication that it's one mole of atoms or one mole of molecules, meaning 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules would react. On the periodic table, the different elements weigh different things, however. In a lab setting, you're measuring something out, you're in the real world, you're measuring something in grams. You can't go and physically count the atoms uh, to obtain this exact number of moles. So in lab settings, you have to measure things out based in grams, but the chemistry is done in units of moles. And these are interchanged back and forth between grams and moles throughout chemistry. And this is done through the molecular weight. So if you have a set number of moles to solve for the mass of that amount, so how much, how many, uh, how many grams does one mole weigh, or how many grams does 0 0.06 moles of something weigh, that would be looking, uh, multiplying it by the molecular weight. The molecular weight is in units of grams per mole. So if you multiply moles by the unit of grams divided by moles, the unit of moles cancels out and you're left with grams. The same would be true in the opposite direction. If you have a mass of something and you want to find out how many moles that is, 
you're dividing by the molecular weight. You're taking grams and it's when you divide by that uh, grams over moles, it's the same as multiplying moles over grams. The molecular weight is the ratio of how many grams there would be per one mole. Uh, so to determine how many moles a set mass would be, you're dividing by the molecular weight. The molecular weight itself is coming from the periodic table. All of the different elements on the periodic table have a set atomic weight. And this atomic weight is the mass, the amount of grams that it would take to comprise of one mole of those atoms. So one mole, 6.02, <clears throat> 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Um, and on the periodic table, those atomic masses are for the atoms themselves. But to obtain a molecular weight or formula weight, this is for determining moles of entire compounds. And these compounds and these molecules are comprised or made up of multiple different atoms. So in the case of something like copper sulfate, there is one copper atom, one sulfur atom, and four oxygen atoms. To obtain one mole of copper, that would be 63.55 grams. One mole of sulfur, would be 32.06 grams. And one mole of oxygen is 16 grams, but there are four of them. So to have four moles of oxygen, it would be 16 times four for 64 grams. Add all of these together and you end up with the overall molecular weight of copper sulfate, which is 159.61 grams. This is how much material in a lab setting would need to be measured or weighed out in order to obtain one mole of the compound of copper sulfate. The concept of the mole has already been touched on a little bit and uh, converting between grams and moles using molecular weight has been uh, covered uh, a little bit in the, in the past. But you're using the atomic weights of each of the different elements to create or generate the molecular weight for an individual molecule or compound. In the case of something like copper sulfate, there is one copper atom, one sulfur atom, and four oxygen atoms in that copper sulfate compound. The molecular weight of that compound would be the mass of one copper plus one sulfur plus four oxygens. Add it together, and that would give you the molecular weight of copper sulfate. The units of the atomic weights and molecular weights would be the unit of grams per mole. That is how much material, how many grams of material is needed for there to be one mole. It's a constant ratio for each atom or each element and for each molecule or compound. So as you're going through in chemistry, one of the best things you could probably do is if you're ever given an amount in grams, determine how many moles that would be. Chemistry is performed in the unit of moles, but you have to measure it in a lab in the unit of grams. And converting between grams and moles is something that will come up continuously 
throughout chemistry labs, throughout chemistry courses, and throughout science in general. While you may have been converting grams to moles and moles to grams before in maybe some other labs or in lecture, this experiment is really looking at the concept of molarity. And molarity is a chemistry unit of concentration. There are many different types of concentration unit, you, units. You can have percentage, you can have parts per million, um, you can have mole fractions. These are different ways to express a concentration. How much of a material is in some amount of volume or some amount of total amount. Um, but in chemistry, molarity is the primary uh, unit of concentration. And this is particular for solutions or for uh, usually liquid samples, where you have a set number of moles of material spread out over some volume. The equation for molarity is moles over liters. This is actually the unit of molarity itself, uh, moles over liters, many times abbreviated as capital M. So, to calculate a molarity, you need both of these components. You need to know how many moles of compound you have and what volume is that spread across. So going back to this, uh, the example of copper sulfate, if 30 grams of copper sulfate is dissolved in a final volume of 250 milliliters, what would the molarity be? So the first thing in any sort of situation, if you have an amount, you have a mass, the best thing to do is convert that into how many moles would this be? So if you have 30 grams, you're converting it into moles. So you're dividing by the molecular weight. 30 divided by 159.61 will give 0 0.1879 moles of copper sulfate. The unit of molarity is moles per liter. And in the, this question, it's given in the unit of milliliters. So that wouldn't also need to be converted. There are 1,000 milliliters in every one liter. So to cancel out milliliters, you're dividing. 250 divided by 1,000 would give a volume of 0 0.250 liters. This is uh, the total number of moles that there are, and they are spread out around this volume. So when you take these and you can uh, divide moles by liters, you're left with the concentration of molarity. It's the ratio between how many moles there are in every liter. That means in this example, uh, there are 0.1879 moles spread across point. 250 liters. That gives a molarity of 0 0.7518. What the molarity means is that within one liter, there would be 0 0.7518 moles of copper sulfate in this particular uh, setup. This experiment is focusing on molarity, the concept of molarity, and using the molarity equation of moles over liter. Molarity is a concentration measurement. You're measuring how much material is there for every amount of volume that you happen to have. 
same uh, another concentration unit would just be percentage or parts per million. These are all ways to quantify how much of the material you actually have when it's dispersed in some amount of volume or some amount of space. So when you're preparing solutions, you're looking at moles over liters. So here I have 0.01 moles of copper sulfate pentahydrate. The molecular weight of copper sulfate pentahydrate is 249 grams per mole. And this is 2.49 grams. There is 0 0.01 moles of copper sulfate pentahydrate. When I combine that with 100 milliliters or 0.1 liters of water, the copper sulfate itself dissolves and instead of just a blue powder sunk to the bottom, you have a blue solution. The copper sulfate is dispersed throughout the water at a specific molarity with an amount of moles of 0 0.01 and a volume of 0.1 liters, the overall molarity of this would be 0 0.01 divided by 0.1 moles per liter, giving you a 0 0.1 molar solution of copper sulfate. When you're preparing solutions, you're taking that solid material, that solid compound, and dispersing it throughout a volume. Once you have the volume itself, you could then measure out a specific volume of this solution of known molarity and determine how many moles of compound would be contained in that solution. So if I have some volume, if I measure this volume, I could be able to see how many moles of copper sulfate I now have in these different portions. In chemistry courses such as this, general chemistry, you're typically looking at inorganic salts or compounds that dissolve in water. Um, you may have seen in balanced chemical reactions the subscript AQ. This means aqueous or dissolved in water. And when these salts or these ionic solids dissolve in water, they break apart into their individual ions. Sticking with the copper sulfate example, one molecule of or one molecule of copper sulfate will dissolve into its individual ions. That would be one copper two plus ion and one sulfate anion. That means if there is a concentration of, let's say, 0 0.25, a solution with a molarity of 0.25 molar copper sulfate, this is a 0.25 molar solution of copper ions, as well as a 0.25 molar solution of sulfate ions. How the compounds actually break apart and how many of these ions exist depend on the compound itself. So in the previous example of copper sulfate, every one molecule made one copper ion and one sulfate ion because these are the separate ions. If you had copper chloride, this breaks apart into one copper ion, but two chloride ions. Cl 
two is not an ion by itself, but it's two separate chloride ions that are both separately bound to the copper. And knowing what these ions are and how they break apart in solution is something that is critical when you're dealing uh, with solutions in chemistry labs. You want to know specifically if you want to prepare a solution or look at the concentration of chloride, using copper chloride there'd be twice as much as if you used sodium chloride of the same molarity. If they were both 0.1 molar copper chloride and sodium chloride, the copper chloride would have twice as much chloride in it. So if there was again the 0.25 molar solution of now copper chloride, that would be 0.25 molar copper ion because for every one molecule, there was one copper ion, but double the amount of the chloride concentration. And that concentration would be 0 0.50 molar chloride ion, because for every one molecule, there can be two ions that dissolve in the solution. So when you look at these different compounds and look at solutions of these, you're looking at solutions of the individual ions. So in the case of cerium sulfate, there would be three cerium ions and two sulfate ions. Nickel nitrate would have one nickel ion and two nitrate ions. And if you were to combine two different solutions that were all aqueous, you would have a solution of copper ion, a solution of cerium ion, and sulfate ion coming from both uh, initial compounds. When solutions are prepared using ionic solids, it's not a solution of the whole compound itself, but the solution of the different ions. Barium ions, and, or barium nitrate, will have no reaction with sodium chloride. However, by changing one of the ions, by changing the, cat, uh, the anion from chloride to sulfate, there is a reaction. Specifically what's happening, the barium itself is reacting with the sulfate. There was no reaction with the barium and the chloride. The same thing can be seen if you change the cation. By changing it from barium to potassium, there's again no reaction with the sodium chloride, but now there's also no reaction with the sodium sulfate. By switching out the different cation, there are different reactions. In these solutions, all of these different compounds break apart into their individual ions, where the 0.1 molar solution of barium nitrate would be a 0.1 molar solution of barium ions, but a 0.2 molar solution of nitrate anions, because for every one barium nitrate, there are two nitrate ions. In the case of sodium sulfate, the overall concentration of sodium sulfate was 0.1 molar. However, because this splits into individual ions, that means the concentration of sodium cations would be 0.2 because there are two sodium ions and the concentration of sulfate would be 0.1 because there is only one sulfate ion. These are the what reacts 
when you perform a reaction. You're looking at the reaction of the individual ions in solution and not the solid compound, but it's the ions that play a role. When you prepare a solution, you need to take into account how many ions are there in the compound and how those would affect the overall molarity of both the cation and the anion. Another concept when dealing with solutions is the concept of dilution. You're taking some amount that you have and spreading it over a larger volume. So this happens all the time. If you have a drink with ice in it and over time that ice melts, you might say it's watered down. But what's happening is that initial drink is now diluted with more water. Those molecules or ions or drink particles are now spread out over a larger volume. And there's a particular calculation when you're using uh, molarities and volumes that specifically looks at dilutions and it's all based on the molarity calculation. So the molarity calculation again is moles over liters. For every uh, liter it contains this amount of moles. That's the <clears throat> concept of molarity. So when you're solving for a dilution, one of the key things to remember is that the number of moles stays the same. The moles are constant throughout the dilution. You're just taking those moles and spreading them out over a larger volume. So in this example, a 30 milliliter solution, uh, 0.5 molar solution of copper sulfate is combined with 50 milliliters of water. What would the final molarity be? You're taking a solution and you're spreading it out over a larger volume. So there are two sides when you perform a dilution. You have initial and you have final. And both of them have the molarity, the moles, and the volume. The moles are constant throughout it. You didn't add any more material. You didn't subtract any more material. You just added more volume. So initially, you're starting with a concentration and a volume. So you can use those two numbers to calculate how many moles of copper sulfate were present initially. That number of moles now ends up being spread out across a larger volume. That 30 milliliters plus the additional 50 milliliters of water. So that same number of moles is now spread out over a larger volume of 80 milliliters. And so you have moles and you have a volume and you calculate what is that final molarity. So initially, 30 milliliters of the 0.5 molar solution, you're multiplying those together to get the number of moles, 0 0.015 moles of copper sulfate, and that is spread out now over a larger volume. The end molarity is 0 0.1875, what started as a higher concentration solution is now lower by adding uh, some of that volume. Because these are both, both sides of the equation contain moles, that it contains the amount of material spread throughout and that's constant, you can set these two equations equal to each other. So the molarity times the, the initial molarity or the starting molarity times that initial volume or starting volume equals some amount of moles. And that is constant in the next stage. Those moles are now spread out over this final volume, 
resulting in a final molarity. So when you're looking through dilutions you, and working through these types of problems, the typical uh, dilution equation is M1, V1, or initial molarity, initial volume, equals M2, V2, the final molarity and final volume. And what this entire equation is, is two of these molarity calculations separate, but then set equal to each other by solving for the number of moles that are constant throughout the dilution. Another way to use the molarity equation and using the concept of moles, volume, and molarity is through dilutions. And this would be determining how many moles there are in very, uh, as you change the concentration. So in the case of potassium permanganate, potassium permanganate is a very intensely colored uh, purple solution. However, by diluting this solution, the concentration is lowering. The same number of moles are always present, but by adding more and more water, they are now dispersed throughout the entire solution. By adding further amounts of water, the overall concentration is decreased, but the number of moles present is still uh, the same. They're now just spread out over a larger volume. And calculating through di uh, dilution calculations, that's something that needs to be remembered, is the number of moles is the same both before and after the dilution. The only thing that's changing is the amount that it's dispersed in. So the volume is changing and that's changing the molarity. So you can take two molarity calculations, molarity equals moles over liters, and set them both equal to moles. And then that would give you the uh, relationship between molarity and volume of one solution versus molarity and volume of, an, of another. As you change those ratios, you're changing the molarity, but the number of moles, the actual compound itself, is still the same. You're just diluting it and spreading it over a larger volume. In this experiment simulation, you're looking at preparing a number of different solutions and calculating moles and going through a few dilutions and seeing how that affects uh, the molarity. And this simulation has a few different components to it that you can move around. You're starting off with by selecting a, a different compounds you can shake in the compound to the actual container. There's a scale where you can read the volume in the container out to two decimal places. So there's a half liter or 0.5 and one liter. There are markings in between uh, being read to 0.1 liters and you can estimate between scale divisions to get another significant figure. So volume readings in this can be read to two decimal places. You can also add additional water through the valve on top um, in order to dilute the solution. You can drain uh, some of the solution from the bottom if you just want to remove some of it. And there is an evaporation scale. And what that does is 
it can slowly or quickly remove just the water. This simulates evaporation where only the water is being removed, but all of the material or all of the compound stays inside. So that way you can see the concentration or see the solution becoming more and more concentrated. So in the first part of the simulation, you're uh, recording a total amount of volume that uh, to start with, you're selecting one of the compounds, you're shaking in some of that material and recording the concentration. Then you're going to use that sliding scale and evaporate the water until the solution becomes saturated. And when the solution is saturated, you're going to be recording what that um, concentration is. And you're going to then, you can then remove just the solid and add a little bit more water to, make, to bring the, the volume back up to something manageable. And you're going to do that with all of the compounds except the drink mix. So when you go to the simulation link, you're going to be selecting the concentration simulation and you're brought into the simulation. You're going to be selecting these, one of these different compounds and you're going to go through all of these throughout the experiment. So it doesn't really matter which order you go in, but you will be doing this for all um, of the different compounds, except the drink mix because I, we don't know what that is. But what you're going to be doing is you're going to be recording the volume, then you're going to be adding some amount of the material. You're going to be recording, moving this uh, measurement device into the solution and recording the molarity. This is in units of moles per liter. This is the molarity of the solution. And you can see if you add more, the concentration increases. Then you're going to be evaporating some of the compound or some of the water until the solution becomes saturated. And you're going to record what the concentration is when it's saturated. So in the calculations, then you'll be calculating what that, uh, how much water was evaporated and what the final volume is based on these concentrations. So the concentration or the calculations themselves in the lab report uh, for this part of the experiment, again, it's all dealing with this equation, the molarity equation. Molarity equals moles over liters and working with this to figure things out. So the first thing you're looking to see how many moles are contained in each one of your solutions uh, at the start and how much material that is, how many grams. So you're taking the molarity, that initial molarity and that starting volume and you're solving for how many moles of material there actually are in that container. And then using the molecular weight, you're going to be determining what the mass of that material actually is in the container. How many grams of that material uh, actually is there in the container? You're also going to be calculating the final volume when it's saturated. And the reason you're calculating this as opposed to just measuring it is because you're using that evaporation scale and you're basing that on the saturation point. And you can keep evaporating more and more water, but that concentration would still stay the same. So to calculate what that actual volume is, that set volume when the solution is saturated, is you're taking the saturated uh, molarity and calculating 
how many moles of material you start it with. So that was here, determining how many moles of material you start it with and condensing it into this much more concentrated uh, solution and then solving for what that volume would be. At what volume would that number of moles uh, create this saturated solution? The second part of the experiment looks at dilutions. And what you're going to be doing is you're going to be filling the container uh, to the top with water, and then you're adding some amount of your compound. And you're, in this case, uh, for part B, you're only choosing one of the compounds. And again, not the drink mix, but you're choosing one of those other compounds and you'll shake in some of the material, you're looking at the concentration, and then you're going to drain out some of that volume. You're going to remove some of that. And then you're going to fill it all the way back up to the top with water using the valve on the top. And you're going, in each case, you're going to be recording uh, the concentration of solution kind of before and after and the volume level um, in the container. And you're going to do that four different times. You're going to keep kind of removing some of that material and then adding more water to fill it back up uh, uh, to the one liter mark to see what those observations are as you're adding more, uh, taking that same volume, but there's fewer and fewer moles spread uh, throughout it. So in part B of the simulation, you're filling the container with water, you're adding a bunch of your compound, recording the concentration, and then you're just gonna drain some of it out. And now you'll add more water and record this new concentration. And you're going through and doing this a few times and seeing one, what are the observations as you keep doing this? What does it look like? How is that working the concentration? or looking, uh, how's that changing the concentration? And in the calculations, you're using these concentration values and using one of the volumes to solve for the other, using the dilution calculation. As far as the calculations go for the second part of the experiment, you're still looking at the molarity calculation of moles over liters, and you're also going to be using the dilution calculation, which is still moles over liters, the molarity calculation. So overall, the questions are asked, the question is asking, how much water are you adding each time you make one of these dilutions. So this is, at the end, what you're trying to solve for. The final volume in each case is one liter. You're filling it all the way back up to the top. So that's the final volume. So if you're trying to solve for how much water you actually add, you need to know how much volume there was to start with. And so initially you have uh, some amount of material. This is before you add the water. Um, so you've drained a little bit of the solution out, so it's not exactly one. You have some amount in there, and you have a molarity. You're trying to solve for what is that volume that you have in there. So you have an initial molarity. After the dilution, you're using water, you're filling it up to the one liter mark. So you have a final volume of one liter and now you have a final molarity. You can set these two equations equal to each other. Again, these are two molarity equations. 
and the number of moles before and after the dilution is the same. So if you have the initial molarity multiplied by the initial volume, that will equal the final molarity multiplied by the final uh, volume. In this case, you have the final volume and final molarity, you have the initial molarity, and you're solving for what this initial volume is. And at, uh, in the end, everything is equaling or totaling up to one liter. So by subtracting the initial volume from one liter, you end up with how much water you actually added to create that dilute solution. Overall, in this experiment, you're looking at how moles, molarity, and volume are all interconnected when you prepare solutions. You're uh, making your own solutions, you're preparing them, and determining molarities, determining moles based on volume, uh, determining volumes based on molarity and moles, and vice versa, looking at all of these and really utilizing that molarity calculation because that is something that throughout chemistry would be incredibly useful and you will need to know how to do uh, these sorts of calculations. You're also looking at dilutions by taking that set number of moles and spreading it out over a larger volume. What that looks like and then how that can be calculated to determine the subsequent lower and lower molarities over the whole system. So at the end, you're looking at how all of these things play a role and how you can look at solutions of both compounds and different ions and have them dispersed throughout different volumes.